Okay, so turning to the topic at hand. Um, a few years ago, as, as Tom mentioned, I published a book called uh, Academia Incorporated. Uh, Tom called it Academy Incorporated, but that's okay, that's okay. Academia Incorporated, uh, How Corporation is Transforming Canadian Universities. And in the book, I devote quite a bit of attention to the issue of, of contract faculty and precarious academic labor. I have to say the response to the book did surprise me a little bit. Uh, I've received a lot of feedback. A lot of people have reached out to me about it. Um, usually just wanting to talk about some aspect of the book and sometimes to relay their own experiences. Um, some people are interested in university administrations for various reasons, right? Some, some people are interested in corporate university research partnerships or, or student issues. But the main issue that people have reached out to me about uh, has been precarious academic labor, you know, without question. Uh, I think there's a reason for that. You know, all aspects of corporatization, as I call it, uh, have important implications and consequences, but, you know, precarious academic labor may be, in some ways at least, the most important of all. You know, it seems to touch upon everything these institutions are, uh, everything they claim to be, and um, I think it really does have profound implications for certainly for instructors, for academic labor, for students, and for higher, higher education at large. I tend to agree with uh, Benjamin Johnson's characterization of precarious academic labor as the rot at the heart of the new corporate university system. I think that's an accurate way to describe it. So I wrote about some of this, some of this rot uh, in the book. And for the past several years, I suppose you could say I've been experiencing a little bit of this uh, this rot firsthand. Since I graduated, I think it was back in 2014, now I've been working as a contract instructor at Carleton, Carleton University here in Ottawa. Uh, now in some ways I have to say I am luckier than most contract instructors and I know it. Uh, why? Well, I've always loved the courses I've taught. I didn't take them out of necessity or desperation. Like a lot of people do, you know, you just have to get whatever's available. Um, and I've been able to teach on some pretty cool topics like climate change and environmental policy and, and corporate crime and things like that. Never in the department where I came from, right? Like a lot of CIs, but uh, uh, you know, around the university, right? So I certainly, I you know, I recognize my good fortune. Um, but at the same time, I have started to experience, started to feel some of the frustrations, indignities that a lot of contract instructors face, right? So I thought maybe I'd just give you a couple of examples of the start here because I think they do, they do speak to broader issues. So for example, uh, I was recently asked by a professor in the Faculty of Education at Lakehead University to be the uh, external examiner for his students' dissertation uh, project. This was a project on something I was fairly familiar with, neoliberalism and corporatization in higher education, right? Um, and the student had apparently used um, my work quite a bit. So yeah, you know, I was very happy to do this. About two weeks later, I got an email from the professor saying that my, his application to have me as the external examiner was rejected outright by the university for one reason, right? Because I was not a, a tenure stream <laughs> professor. Um, and he was quite angry and embarrassed about this, but it didn't, apparently didn't matter what he thought. It didn't matter what he thought was good for his student. It didn't matter what his student thought, and it certainly didn't matter in the slightest what I thought about the whole thing, right? So, um, you know, that was that. Um, so that was well, a bit of a kick in the ass. Uh, and then there was something that happened this year that I wouldn't mind sharing. It was especially bizarre. In early April, I was informed uh, that I had won the 2019 Faculty of Public Affairs Teaching Excellence Award at Carleton, right? That's the good part of the story. That's the good part of the story, yeah. I mean, I was obviously very happy of this, proud about this. It was a great accomplishment. Um, well, that happiness and, and, and pride lasted for about two weeks because in the middle of the month, uh, about two weeks later, I was informed that I had lost two of the three courses that I had been teaching at Carleton for the last five years. Right? Just kind of summarily in one day uh, when you open that stupid email attachment and your courses aren't there. Uh, courses that formed much of the basis, most of the basis, for me winning that, that teaching award. Right? So, so I found the, you know, the, the juxtaposition of being recognized for teaching excellence uh, at the same time as losing my teaching assignments a little bit jarring, right? Um, 
thanks for the teaching award, now you're firing me? That's weird. It's weird. It's a weird way to, yeah, well, whatever. Um, you know, I, I wasn't technically fired, I know that, um, but it sure felt like it. Right? I did get a pretty little statue out of it, so it, not, not, all, not all was lost. Um, but it was such a strange experience, and, and <clears throat> more than a little ironic, you know, I thought, I made sure I pointed out that irony at the, uh, in my acceptance speech for the event in May. Some of the administrators in the audience were a little bit uncomfortable uh, when, I, when I mentioned it, uh, which I knew was going to be the case, but I, but I thought I should mention it there because it really does speak to much broader and systemic problems um, where academic labor is, labor is concerned, and that's how I framed it. I said, you know, this is not about me, but, you know, here's what happened to me, and, you know, perhaps you, know, you should pay attention to that because it's a it's a pretty serious issue, um, and that really relates to job security, right? It may sound like I'm complaining. I'm, I'm really not. I've, I've known for a long time what this game entailed. Um, and uh, if you're a contract instructor for long enough, you will have your own stories, right? You will have them, um, for sure. But I think these experiences, they afforded me some, some pretty valuable insight into the kinds of things that contract instructors experience routinely, some valuable insight into the kind of stuff I was writing about. Right? Not experiencing, but writing about. So I can certainly now empathize in a way that just wasn't possible before. And, you know, it, it also confirms something else to me that I've been thinking about for a long time. And that is, I'm not going to play this game forever. Right? <laughs> not a chance. Now, I, again, I'm lucky enough to be able to say that at this point. But uh, until my, you know, mad dash for the exodor of academia happens, I'll... I will continue to, to speak and write about issues like precarious academic labor because despite everything I've already said and despite everything I will say, uh, I still believe that public universities are really amazing places. Right? In fact, I think they are unique and, and irreplaceable institutions and, and I don't want to see them uh, or the people within them debased and destroyed. Right? Um, that's the main reason I wrote the book. And that's the main reason I'm, I'm here with you today. So, um, moving on from my own little pity party here. Um, it is hard to find a lot of good news when it comes to contract faculty these days. But certainly one positive development, I think, is that the issue of precarious academic labor has, has finally, labor has finally sort of broken into the mainstream. I mean, you can find pretty regular articles now in the Globe and Mail, CBC, that, that report these things fairly accurately. Before they didn't really report them at all, uh, even with an empathetic tone, you know, sometimes. Um, and this breakthrough, if you can call it that, it, it was mainly the result of, of contract faculty activism. And it's a breakthrough that has happened in spite of, in spite of the efforts of Canadian, many Canadian universities to keep this issue under wraps. Um, and that's, I think it's an important point, and I'm going to return to that. Another, another very positive development is by now there's a lot we know and can speak to about precarious academic labor in Canada. I'm certainly not going to run through uh, everything we know. Um, you know, there's a great uh, series of panels tomorrow that are going to talk about these things. But I would like to say just a couple of words at the start about what we know, okay? Um, much of which will be familiar to to the people in this room. So just to start very basically, we know that contract faculty are often, the wages they're paid are often scandalous. Right? See no other word, but can think of no other better word than scandalous. Generally better than the United States, but that's not saying much at all, right? Um, it depends on the province, but, but CIs are paid somewhere between one third and one half usually of what permanent faculty get paid per course, right? Uh, Sometimes this is really extreme. I grew up in Manitoba, and I gave a talk at the University of Winnipeg a few years ago where I pointed out, or pointed out something that the contract faculty there knew very well. And that was that a, a, a contract instructor teaching five single-term courses uh, actually ended up making below the city's low-income cutoff, or you know, poverty line. That's a lot of teaching, right? Five, five courses. Uh, in fact, a recent uh, survey of contract faculty in Ontario showed that, showed that over 30% of them uh, were living below the poverty line. That rises to almost half when you take out other sources of income that they're able to, to generate. Um, 
In contrast, right, tenure stream faculty in Canada are on average the highest paid in the world. Right? That's been shown over and over again. Um, it's also true that within universities, you know, uh, Doug Ford's plan to restrict wage increases for public sector workers um, very likely to hurt contract faculty most of all. Right? It's going to really impede union ability to bargain for those workers, especially. Um, it's true that universities don't always abide by wage freezes. Um, I do remember a couple of years ago, I think this is the case, I, I didn't, I meant to go back and check, but the association of professors here at the University of Ottawa actually took the university to court uh, a few years ago because they gave two of their senior administrators massive pay hikes that were right, right at the time when the wage freeze was going on. So, um, so yeah, they don't, always, they don't always abide by that, but you can be sure that they will abide by the wage freeze uh, where contract instructors are concerned certainly here uh, and elsewhere as well. What else do we know? We know that uh, in addition to lousy pay, <coughs> contract faculty in Canada often lack health or other benefits uh, that permanent faculty and many other Canadian workers take for granted. Right? In fact, a, uh, a very recent cross-national survey, it was an excellent survey of, of contract faculty in Canada, found that 63% of them do not have any health benefits whatsoever. 69% uh, lack dental benefits. Uh, those are astonishing figures. I mean, I knew it was bad. I didn't know it was quite that bad. Uh, that survey was conducted by uh, Karen Foster and uh, Louise Birdsell Bauer, published by the CAUT. I know Louise is uh, scheduled to participate in a roundtable tomorrow. Tom, did you know that you're actually on the cover of that publication? Or Tom is? Yeah, you know. It's a really good picture. It's amazing what technology can do these days, right? <laughs> oh, no, 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 I'm just kidding. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great publication, great picture, Tom, there. Uh, and even when, when contract faculty are eligible for benefits, some universities are making it increasingly difficult for them to collect. Recently, UBC found a very innovative way to deny benefits to contract faculty. The administration began to issue contracts that purposely put a few days of leave between a CI's spring session and summer session, right? So it was not considered a, a, a continuous permanent period of employment from, uh, from January to, to August, which meant that they were ineligible to collect any benefits in the summer months. And they were doing that to a whole bunch of people around the university, just, you know, just this little technical change. That's, you know, very innovative indeed. Uh, it happens more often than you might think. What else do we know? We know that contract faculty are generally not required nor encouraged to participate in university governance. In fact, they are often excluded from even the most basic decision-making bodies in the university. Uh, that being said, that survey I mentioned by, by Karen and Luis revealed that around three quarters of CIs do end up doing uh, committee and other service work for their institutions, most of it unpaid, right? And of course, that's in addition, in addition to all the unpaid writing and research and. Uh, everything else that they do. We know that uh, precarious academic layer does negatively impact student learning and student outcomes. This is kind of a controversial point. <clears throat> Every time I bring it up, there's usually someone that screams, no, it doesn't. Contract faculty are great teachers. Yes, yes, they are. In fact, evidence suggests they are uh, excellent teachers. Uh, that's not the problem. Um, it's because of the precarious nature of contract work. This often results in barriers and disincentives to quality teaching. And this happens for all kinds of reasons, but much of the negative impact on students appears to revolve around the lack of engagement and interaction with accessible professors. This is more important than you might think. The research suggests it's very important. Students just tend to do a lot better in terms of academic outcomes, um, even integrating into university life if they have you know, meaningful relationships with their professors, something that can be especially difficult with contract instructors who are overworked who lack office space, uh, who have to fly around to different universities to teach, uh, so on and so forth. The, the public seems to understand this. Um, <clears throat> according to a survey I saw, about 65% of, uh, of respondents, Ontarians, agreed that less student-faculty uh, engagement does negatively impact educational quality. The point, however, does seem to be lost on many administrators. Um, my favorite com one of my favorite comments on this was by a high-ranking administrator here, right here at the University of Ottawa, who uh, 
stated last year, no it wasn't last year, it was a few years ago, that the lack of student-professor interaction wasn't a problem at all because there's email. Right? That was his, he's still teaching, he's still working here by the way. I won't mention his name, but can't argue with that, right? What else? Well, we know that precarious academic work everywhere is making people sick, both physically and mentally. And this certainly applies to precarious academic labor as well. Um, one Ontario survey found that if you look at uh, contract instructors who don't have stable employment outside the university, which most of them don't, 89%, uh, just 89%, said that they uh, have experienced considerable personal strain <coughs> due to their employment status. Karen and Luis's survey confirmed these findings from across the country. They found that 87% of CIs uh, believe that their mental health has been negatively affected by their contract status. Now, 89%, 87%, these are astonishing figures, barely below the level of statistical error. And of course we know that a big part of the personal strain and stress that these people go through result from the lack of job security and correspondingly academic freedom. Um, that most contract instructors experience. And I think this aspect of the problem is a lot more profound than a lot of people realize. You know, CIs, as sure most of you know, can be dismissed from their position without the right to appeal, right, due process, uh, without administrators even having to provide a reason. In fact, they don't have to fire you. They just don't, don't renew your contract, and you know, essentially, kind of like what happened to me a little bit. Um, it's very easy for them. Right, it's remarkably easy. And uh, I have to say, some universities seem to be doing their very best to reduce the limited job security that CIs do have. You know, at Carleton right now, they're in bargaining. Uh, QP 4600 that represents uh, contract faculty and, and TAs are in bargaining. And uh, from what I've heard from the bargaining committee, the university wants to make it more difficult to get incumbency, reduce the incumbency period from 60 months to 36 months, and though they haven't come, come right out and say it, said it, um, they also seem to want to eliminate all multi-term contracts for CIs at the university. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens at Carleton, but these things are uh, certainly not unusual. <coughs> so they lack job security, can, let me go, can be let go for all kinds of reasons, including because of any kind of controversy they might generate, right? A controversy within their department, controversy related to their pedagogy, uh, speaking out on controversial issues, speaking out against your own university. Try being a contract instructor at a major university in the United States and very openly and prominently criticizing Israeli policy in the West Bank or Gaza. Try it. If there's a better way to get yourself fired south of the border, I have yet to hear it. In fact, I've had contract faculty in Toronto tell me that they won't even touch the Israel-Palestine conflict in any of their classes. And they won't talk about it outside the classroom either, right? They're, they're, they're too scared. They know what that might entail. Uh, and they simply won't do it. And that's just one example of an issue uh, that can get you into you know, quite serious trouble. Um, there's plenty of others. Needless to say, you know, this situation creates a very powerful disincentive to engage with any kind of controversial material, both inside and outside of the classroom. What's the result? One, one result is self-censorship that I just alluded to, right? A very silent self-censorship of thousands of contract faculty um, holding insecure appointments because they're intimidated and they're, they're scared. They can't perform as public intellectuals. They can't say what they believe. They don't feel they can take risks because doing so often means they can't put food on the table, or it might mean that. You know, this is by far the most pressing threat to academic freedom and freedom of speech on campus. You wouldn't know that by listening to people today like uh, Jordan Peterson, Margaret Wente, uh, Rex Murphy, you know, some of the classic Canadians, right? Um, who insist that, it, no, the problem is, oh, what do they call them? Neo-Marxist, post-modernist ideologues and their uh, pathological culture of political correctness. And politicians have entered this fray recently, right? Andrew Scheer, 
Doug Ford talking about, actually even talking about cutting off funding to universities because they are places of left-wing indoctrination. Um, Gander Shear actually, didn't he drop leaflets over a university recently? I forget what university, saying, you know, don't trust your left-wing professors or something like that. In my view, if those people were really concerned, really serious about things like academic freedom, freedom of speech on campus, they would be denouncing how the structural conditions of you know, precarious academic work have systematically produced this unenviable situation from the inside, because there is a problem there. They just have their finger on the wrong one. Maybe they're just ignorant, I don't know. But I think their, their, uh, their silence on this matter uh, does speak volumes. It, it should go without saying that any public university in which the fear of taking risks, the fear of speaking out, the fear of speaking the truth as you see it, um, if that hampers the free expression of ideas, that is a severely diminished institution. I, I don't even know if you can call it a university anymore, to be quite honest. I really don't. Um, and this represents a real victory for those who want to silence dissent and activism emanating from the university, and a real victory for those who want to keep contract faculty in their place. Right? Uh, if you're a contracting sector fighting for greater rights, greater job security, as the story goes, you know, if you name the problem, if you publicize the problem, you often become the problem. And that can have real implications for your, for your employment and your career. Okay, so there's, you know, there's a lot we do know, uh, a lot of stuff I didn't mention. And I think it's a very good thing that we, you know, we know these things by now. Uh, it makes these things somewhat easier to uh, counteract. But there has been one important piece of knowledge, very important, that has eluded us for decades. This massive overarching gap in our knowledge about this segment of the academic workforce, and that's really related to the numbers, right? Uh, how many people actually comprise this growing academic underclass? How many academics are struggling with precarious employment in Canada? Who are they? Where are they? And so on. Uh, thankfully, this knowledge gap has been closed to some extent. It was closed late last year when the CCPA, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, published the first, it's unbelievable, the first national study of contract faculty in Canada, late 2018, right? I mean, I don't... It's, it's, it boggles the mind how this came so late. Um, this was uh, produced by uh, Chandra Pasma and Erica Shaker. They didn't get data from every university, but they did a really great job, and it's, it is the most comprehensive study to date. And in short, you know, their data shows that, that more than half, more than half of uh, academic appointments are now contract appointments in Canada. And we're not quite at the level of the United States, but we're, well, we seem to be on our way. What was particularly interesting to me about that study was their methodology. The methodology they used, or maybe were forced to use, they used freedom of in information legislation in every province uh, to get this data. This is something I did as well in my, in my research on contract faculty in Ontario a few years ago, and I actually met with Chandra beforehand um, just to sort of give her a bit of a heads up about you know, what to expect. And one of the things I told her was to expect significant pushback. I mean, this is one of the reasons you're using uh, freedom of information legislation in the first place. But even then, expect significant pushback. And you know, I tried to say some of the ways you could get around it. I want to address this pushback a little bit because I think it's very revealing in its own right, and it's had really important consequences. A big reason, I would say the primary reason, why researchers were unable to get their hands on this data, and I'm talking for decade after decade after decade, was because of the actions and the inactions of university administrations across Canada. In other words, there was a very consistent pattern of deliberately stonewalling researchers, including Statistics Canada, right? Um, not just academics who were trying to get their hands on, on some of this information. You know, how many academics are actually working precariously? Now, I want to say at the outset, uh, I know there are a lot of administrators that do a very good job. You know, they recognize the nature of this problem. They're not happy about this problem. They're not any more happy about this problem than we are. The reason I say that is twofold. Uh, one, because I think tactically it just makes a lot of sense to work with administrators who recognize the nature of the problem and, and are concerned about it. But two, I, I prefer to pre preempt, I guess you could say, any indignation 
that may come from my comments. Uh, I talked about some of this stuff in Toronto a couple of years ago, and uh, one administrator in the audience, I don't know how to put it, she had a bit of a temper tantrum. Let's just put it that way. She was not happy with what I had to say at all. Uh, remember she kept calling me James? My name's Jamie. She kept calling me James over and over again. I think in an attempt to kind of scold me. The only person that calls me James in my life is my mother when she's really mad at me, right? So it brought me right back to my adolescent days. Um, so, I mean, and, and it's true. My point is not to paint all administrators with the same brush, but, you know, to highlight the really crucial role that administrators have played in preventing, um, preventing us from answering these extremely important questions about academic labor. So I want to say a few words about this because I think it's really important. It continues to go on. Uh, I think a very useful illustration of how many, certainly not all, right, as I said, but many senior administrators view the issue of uh, university contract employment can be found in a major report released by the Association of University and Colleges of Canada, it's now called Universities Canada, uh, several years ago. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Universities Canada has a, a board of directors, a 13 member board of directors that includes 12 university presidents on it, right? That's the organization. So this was a major report on Canadian university faculty. Big, thick report, uh, included all kinds of things. One of the things it did not include was any real attention to contract faculty whatsoever. In fact, the only mention, you should check it out sometime, the only mention of contract faculty came in the form of a little box, like a, like a vignette, I don't know what you call it, something like that, right? Um, that wasn't even part of the main text. It was kind of just off to the side. Uh, and it was a total of 367 words on contract faculty in this major report on university faculty in Canada. Despite its being only 367 words, it really spoke volumes. In this little blurb, <clears throat> there's no acknowledgement whatsoever of the challenges or hardships faced by contract faculty. None. Zero. Uh, in fact, uh, according to Universities Canada, part-time academic work benefits instructors, students, and universities alike. Right. Everybody wins. Uh, the, uh, the document states, for example, that part-time positions provide both the employer and the employee with an opportunity to determine if each is suited for the other. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, in other words, uh, these positions offer a, offer a testing ground for institutional fit or are precursors to tenure-track jobs. The phrase, get with the times, seems to come to mind. I mean, this may have been true half a century ago. It bears absolutely no reality in today's academy. Um, the document also suggests a number of things that I'm sure you'll appreciate. Most contract faculty are practicing professionals from the community. Uh, this is absolutely not the case. Uh, that part-time contract work is all about choice. People are just choosing to do it. Right? Um, also not true and, and profoundly dismissive of the realities of contract work. And that the I like this one. The main contribution these employees make is to, quote, satisfy the fluctuating short-term teaching needs of Canadian universities. That's, uh, that's quite a statement. And so far beyond insulting, it's, it really is hard to find the words. The uh, sheer number of errors and omissions in this major report on uh, university faculty related to contract faculty, uh, it's, 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 it's remarkable. It's not surprising. Um, administrators have every interest in downplaying this issue. You know, I understand that. Um, so it's perhaps not surprising. But they actually went further than this. Okay, they actually went further. And it's this last series of statements that, uh, for me at least, takes things just to an entirely different level. <laughs> the document states, quote, it is very difficult to determine the degree to which Canadian universities are relying on part-time faculty. There is some evidence uh, of greater use of part-time faculty in the U.S. However, it is not possible to determine if this trend is taking place in Canada. The difficulties in collecting data on part-time faculty led Stats Canada to suspend its part-time survey in 2001. That's quite a statement. I mean, they're right about one thing. It has been very, very difficult to determine the degree to which universities are relying on contract faculty, right? Uh, and yes, uh, collecting this data has been very difficult, including for Statistics Canada. The obvious question is why? Right? Why is that the case? There are a number of reasons, but the biggest reason 
is that many universities have simply refused to release this information to researchers, including to Statistics Canada, which is why they suspended their part-time survey in 2001, because no one would give them any data, right? I love how they threw in the Stats Canada thing. That was, that was great. Universities have always claimed they've been unable to collect this data, unable to produce it. Uh, they don't have time. It's too hard. Uh, they're doing other more important things. Not every university, not every administration. This has been very, very common, though. So look, I, I, you know, I think it's one thing to ignore this issue. If they, if they want to bury their heads in the sand about it, that's up to them. Um, it's quite another thing to act actively inhibit researchers from obtaining this data decade after decade. And then to turn around and say, well, you know, unfortunately it's just not possible to determine if this, if this trend is happening in Canada. Um, it's just not possible to determine if universities are stuffing their classrooms with exploited academics. I, I mean, you gotta admire their, what's the word, I don't know. Well, pick your word, right? Gall. That's, a, that's the nicest way of putting it I can think of. Um, so I urge you to urge you to read that uh, that faculty report. Well, you know, back in 2012, I decided to take another shot at this, um, and I decided to use freedom of information legislation here in Ontario, the FIPA Act, in order to get my hands on some of this this data. I, I, I it was pretty simple. I wanted to know how many uh, CIs are being hired in the arts and social sciences. Specifically, you know, in relation to tenure stream faculty, you know, not rocket science. And actually, the first thing I had to do was change the wording of my information requests. I had originally had the term contract faculty in my inter information requests. I may have been a, a bit naive. This was a problem because many administrators didn't know what the hell I meant by contract faculty. <laughs> what is a contract faculty? Um, why the confusion? The confusion was because they didn't consider. CIs to be faculty. That's not the real faculty. That's not faculty at the university, right? So then, so what are you talking about, right? You're getting you're getting things mixed up. In one of these cases, I got a very stern lecture from uh, human resources personnel, who uh, what did they say about how universities work? I remember that. There's this long thing about how universities work and and the importance of uh, accurate terminology in social science research. And that's uh, I, I won't tell you how that conversation ended. Um, wasn't pretty. So I got that stuff worked out. Long story short, what happened? I eventually received data from all 18 institutions. In only two cases, uh, Lakehead and McMaster were complete sets of data never provided. So 16 out of 18. I'm not saying it was easy. I had to fight with these institutions for a long time sometimes to get this information, but I did. Why is 16 out of 18 so significant? It's because the, well, because history set up a bit of a controlled experiment in this case. Uh, in 2004, the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations, OCUFA, uh, sent very similar information requests to the same universities. Um, basically wanting exactly the same in information I did. But this was before universities were included under the FIPA legislation, right? That happened in 2006. What did, the, uh, what did OCUFA receive? They received data from three out of 20. Three out of 20 institutions, right? For me, 16 out of 18. For them, 3 out of 20. What explains the difference? Well, it's pretty obvious, right? Universities of Ontario now had a legal obligation to respond seriously to information requests. And back in 2004, when Okufa tried, they had no such, no such obligation at all. Um, they could still pretend that they were unable to uh, collect this data. Now again, it wasn't easy, um, but I did get the data. I won't went through the numbers. It, they just confirmed what I, what we all know, right? Contract faculty, the numbers just skyrocketing at, at many institutions. I'll give you one example in the, in the, in those departments that are now part of the uh, faculty of liberal arts and professional studies at York. You know this massive faculty. It's one of the biggest in Canada. Uh, the number of uh, part-time contract deployments increased by 722 positions between 2000 and 2010, from 521 to 1253, or by 136%. In contrast, 10-year uh, stream positions increased by 4.8%, uh, or 100 positions. There were a lot of examples like that. But what I want to highlight here is not the numbers. 
I want to highlight some of the pushback I received, the interference I received from uh, some of the administrators, usually, usually senior administrators who I worked with either on a more informal basis or who kind of caught wind of what I was doing somewhere along the way, right? Um, so I'll give you a few very quick examples of the kind of things that, that I encountered. Uh, at one institution, I was informed by the uh, Access to Information Coordinator that uh, no decision had yet been made about releasing the data, even though they'd collected it all, and I'd even paid them the fee. Right? After an additional two month a day delay, this coordinator, she, she conceded to me, she was kind of embarrassed about it, that certain interested parties within the administration wanted to see what the data showed before making it public. And one of these dudes actually phoned me up. Uh, he wanted to know how I was going to use the data and what my intentions were. Right? My intentions. It was, quite frankly, a very creepy experience. Um, he would say things to me like, uh, what are you going to do with this data, son? Called you son. Thinking back, it sounded a little bit like Darth Vader. Right? Come with me, come with me, my son. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was very weird. Um, that's how I remember it now, you know, Darth Vader. Um, at one point, he mumbled something like, universities should not be funding students to conduct research that undermines administrations. Um, which was hilarious. Uh, it, yeah, it was weird. Um, and I actually had to wait another three months after that before the interested parties, uh, presumably including Darth Vader himself, um, eventually relented right, and, and, and gave me the data. So uh, that was one bizarre encounter. At another institution that relies very, very heavily on contract faculty, uh, one high-level administrator he kept giving me justifications over and over again about why his institution relies so heavily on, on contract faculty. All these excuses, uh, justifications in his mind. And for these reasons, he said, the information I was requesting could be contentious. Right? And therefore, I should consider at least giving up my search. Right? Because I shouldn't be... Perhaps I shouldn't be rocking the boat, this is too contentious, um, please just go away. When I didn't do that, he started asking me things like, uh, what are you going to do with this data? I want to know. Are you going to publish this data? How are you going to spin this data? Right? Um, when I eventually received the quote unquote contentious data, literally years later, this same administrator, he offered me three pieces of advice on three separate occasions, and I'll never forget them. Uh, the first was, be sure to treat this data with great care. Uh, the second was, be sure to treat this data with great caution. And the third, my favorite, be sure to treat this data with great care and caution. Um, yeah, again, very weird experience. I felt like I was getting subtle warnings from the mafia or something. <laughs> One final example, at another institution, uh, a university president actually intervened personally. Not once, but twice uh, under section 27.1 of the FIPA on the grounds that uh, processing my requests would unreasonably interfere with the operations of the institution. Never quite figured out how giving me a few employment statistics would interfere with the operations of the entire university, but uh, that was the claim. Um, and her inter interventions did cause a very long data delay uh, I suspect it was in an effort to get me to, to drop the request if possible. Um, you know, broad language in, in freedom of information legislation is often used for precisely that reason. And in full disclosure, this was actually the same university president that, that shook my hand and I think even handed me my diploma, I can't really remember now, during my uh, doctoral convocation at Carleton in 2014. I, I briefly considered saying something like, you know, I probably would have complicated last fall if it wasn't for people like you stonewalling me, but she had such a big smile on her face, I, I couldn't bring myself to do that. It's a very happy day for her. Okay, you know, that's just a sample, certainly not everything, of uh, what I would consider to be more or less political interventions by senior administrators. And it did yield some very valuable insights. And again, the very fact that I was able to get this data um, you know, eventually from nearly every institution, really speaks to the legitimacy or lack thereof of previous information claims, doesn't it? Uh, 
I mean, it suggests quite strongly that the failure to make this data public in the past did not result uh, from their lack of ability to collect this data. Uh, it resulted, at least in part, in the political motivations of senior administrators. And that new CCPA study that I just talked about, right, that cross-national study uh, of contract faculty, it just confirms this. Um, you know, some, some universities, like the University of Ottawa, uh, refused to initially give them anything. They had to appeal, they had to pressure them. Uh, U of O eventually relented. Uh, some universities claimed exemptions under the FEEP on the basis of labor relations. They had to appeal those decisions. Some universities hit them with outrageous fees. Athabasca hit them with a $22,000 uh, fee. Um, sounds bad until you realize that uh, McMaster, no, it was Dalhousie, they hit them with a $55,000 fee. Actually, the, the, Dal the, the Dalhousie case is amazing. Um, the university said it would cost $55,000 to compile six years of data. So the researcher said, well, okay, we'll see what the union has, right? The local union, QP 3912 and the Faculty Association. Yeah, QP and the Faculty Association were able to give them the data they were requesting for free. Not only that, here's the kicker. The information they were able to provide came from reports that you, the university was sending them every year, right? It's unbelievable. So clearly, you know, the university had the information all along and it would have been very easy to, to put it together. It certainly would have cost $55,000 anyway. Um, so I think one thing we need to recognize in this battle is how universities tend to view the problem of precarious academic labor. I think it's really important. In large measure, it is seen as a political problem public relations problem. It's an embarrassment that needs to be ideally never made public. And you got to hand it to them. They were quite successful in keeping this data under wraps for a long, long time. Um, Tom mentioned in the introduction, you know, the problem that has no name. Yeah, well, why doesn't it? It's a good point, right? Why doesn't it have a name? Yeah, well, it's partly because of this. I think this has had enormous consequences. How do you deal with the problem effectively if you don't know how severe the problem is? How do you come up with policies and solutions to help these people if you don't know who these people are, you know, where they are, how much of the teaching they're doing, what faculties they're in? It's you know, virtually impossible. So I think universities have a lot to answer for here. I, I really do. Um, their preoccupation, much like you know, in the line of any good image conscious corporation uh, with you know, institutional reputation and brand image uh, has come at the expense of a very large segment of their academic workforce. You know, uh, solutions, improvements might have come about a lot sooner if this knowledge had been made public. Uh, I think this has had very real world consequences for you know, thousands of academics across the country. Maybe we should be demanding reparations of some sort. Just a thought. Okay, well, you know, enough about administrations um, forever, maybe. If I ever want to talk about it again. Uh, I just want to shift gears now a little bit. I know I don't have a lot of time. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about where we go from here, okay? I'm not going to discuss concrete strategies or policies. I think, you know, people at the conference tomorrow um, are going to be doing some of that, and the, the panels look, look really great. What I want to do is briefly address two prominent myths, misconceptions, or, or, or false claims to uh, lines of bullshit, basically, um, that continue to exist around the issue of precarious academic labor in particular, and the academic job market in general. And the main reason I want to do this is because I think that both of them, uh, in one way or another, serve to really inhibit not only our ability to see this problem for what it is, but to respond effectively to it. So I'll try to go pretty quick. I mean, you all, you all may not believe or internalize these claims, but I, I know that a lot of CIs, they do, right? And I think it's uh, a real barrier to effective, effective organizing. So first mythical claim, it goes something like this. Academia is a robust meritocracy. Where the best and the brightest and the most deserving rise to the top, uh, success is mostly based on hard work, perseverance, talent, and skill. So if I'm stuck with contract work, if I'm stuck in a precarious position, 
uh, it's pretty much all on me. My failure is justified. It's hard not to feel that way sometimes, but, uh, but of course we know that things like class inequality, occupational attainment, are largely the product of a whole range of structural, socioeconomic, uh, institutional forces that are actually much more important, on average, to determining one's place in the occupational hierarchy than individual characteristics. For whatever reason, I've never been able to figure it out, academics and intellectuals more broadly have real difficulty grasping this, especially when it comes to their own position in the occupational hierarchy. It's, it's, it's quite striking, you know. Um, I'm convinced that no other professional sector believes more strongly in meritocracy than, than academics do, uh, especially in relation to their own work. And, you know, I, I think, including perhaps people who should know better, right? I mean, people for, you know, critical social scientists who uh, have a very sophisticated understanding of the structural mechanisms of, of class inequality in other areas, uh, can't seem to bring it to bear on their own, on their own situation. Um, and, you know, a sophisticated understanding of how merit, meritocratic belief systems disguise these, these realities, again, can't seem to, you know, uh, bring it to bear on their own situation. Um, and it's not just structural determinants either. I mean, let's be honest, uh, there's a ton of luck involved. There really is. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, entry into the tender stream is, is often just a matter of, just as much a matter of good fortune as anything else. You know, maybe the hiring committee wanted someone who could teach that dreaded uh, quantitative methods course, right, that nobody else wanted to teach. Um, you know, maybe they wanted someone who published a book because books are the true measure of scholarship. Or someone who hasn't published a book because journal articles are the true measure of scholarship. Right? Maybe they wanted someone who could, you know, plan parties well. You know, I don't know. There's all kinds of things that are brought to bear here. Um, merit is malleable. Hiring decisions are often very arbitrary. I know someone who's been, who was a tenured professor for 40 years, and he said, never in my 40 years have I seen the best candidates, the most qualified candidates be shortlisted, and never in my 40 years have I seen the best candidates, the most qualified candidates get the job. Uh, it may have been just his department, but I don't, I, I doubt it, I mean, I doubt it. Well, failing to recognize these things this is a huge barrier, right, to effective action. Not only does it uh, lead to feelings of inferiority and helplessness because so many CIs internalize their failure solely as personal failure, but it reduces their ability to, and their willingness to, to fight against the structural conditions that are really at the root of the problem and that are open to change, right? This is not to suggest, I'm not trying to suggest that uh, intellectual skills, hard work, uh, talent doesn't play a role in the academic jog mark, but of course it does. But you know what? Where you end up, more often than not, on average, is based on uh, forces that are not under your control. Um, I think, you know, uh, and that includes your position in the academy as well. Okay, second mythical claim, which is certainly related to the first, and it's a big one. And that is that the uh, so-called free market in academia is primarily responsible for sorting individuals into the job market. For decades, free market ideology has done colleges and universities the enormous service, and it really has been a service, of uh, covering up and justifying the casualization process. Uh, in reality, right, the accelerated use of contract employment has always represented, since the 1970s, uh, to a large extent, a deliberate management strategy to impose what's called labor flexibility in the academy. That's not some conspiracy theory, uh, any more than it is to say that you know, it's conspiracy when uh, the private sector uses uh, more precarious, flexible employment, right? You know, an insecure army of private just-in-time workers performs many of the same functions in the academy as it does at Walmart, right? We should recognize that too. One of the ways you know it's not primarily market forces is because contract positions are increasingly be created where tenure stream positions can and should exist. You know, market theory assumes, and a lot of people assume, that universities want to hire more permanent faculty and that they will hire more permanent faculty when they can afford to do so. Uh, that's the assumption. That's not what's happening, right? The reality is that uh, permanent positions are being systematically eliminated, largely through attrition, you know, largely through attrition. 
Uh, this is evidenced by the fact that you know the jobs of, of uh, retiring professors are simply not being replaced. <coughs> Sometimes in some provinces, about a third, a third of the time, and so on. Uh, in fact, just two years ago, Stats Canada released some data on full-time academics. Uh, one of the things they found is that between 2000 and uh, 2010 and 2017, the number of full and associate professors increased by eight and five percent, respectively. The number of assistant professors, the new tenure track professors, declined by 17 percent. Right? Yeah, people are advancing if they've already made it into the stream. They're just not making it there uh, anymore. And of course, this is exactly what's happening in the larger economy, right? Where um, the number of part-time temporary workers is, is growing way beyond what is necessary to fill temporary uh, market needs. Actually, it's even happening on campuses in other areas. You know, the frequency and duration of, of casual appointments in bookstores, uh, food and cleaning services, other support services, growing, you know, um, it suggests that these, these positions could easily be replaced by full-time positions. Uh, but they're not being replaced by full-time positions. Why? Well, it's pretty obvious, you know. Um, universities are choosing casual appointments because they have less, fewer obligations uh, to these workers. Me to wrap it up, Tom? Is that your order? Yeah, would you Jerry, so Yeah, almost done. Um, another reason uh, to suspect that these are largely choices is some research, recent research, I'll just point this out, by the, the CCPA. Uh, what this research suggests is that universities are nowhere near as cash-strapped as they've been letting on. Um, it's kind of interesting. I mean, public funding cuts have hurt at universities, and there's no question that they've impacted hiring decisions, but you know, what's that, what's that Shakespeare line? Right? Uh, they doth protest too much, uh, methinks. Yeah, um, the CCP analyzed the accounting practice of, of 20 universities in Canada. Uh, in their words, just as the characters in The Wizard of Oz discovered when they pulled back the curtain, we found a trickery and illusion has a lot to do with the messaging around university financing. While well, a few universities in our sample were financially distressed, most of them generated stable surpluses, and many had generated much larger surpluses over the past decade than in previous years. And yet all of them were doing things like uh, creating larger class sizes, uh, casualized, you know, uh, increasing the casualization of the economy, uh, every single one of them. Right? Again, this challenges very much free market theory, which assumes this just isn't happening. Um, I won't run through what they were doing. It was pretty. You know, restricted surpluses, unrestricted surpluses, accounting tricks, uh, paying administrators a lot more money and then disguising it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, and I, I know some of the panels are going to talk about this tomorrow, so we'll talk much more about it. Okay, I know I have no time left, so one more minute, one more minute. There is no question, there has been some real progress in improving the lives and the working conditions of contract faculty in Canada. Um, greater access to benefits, sometimes partial access to governance, greater institutional supports, that kind of thing, uh, depending on the institution. And we've seen the growth of all kinds of new regularized positions, right? Uh, you got rolling contracts, multi-year contracts, um, sometimes full-time contracts, which do offer a greater degree of uh, employment stability. It would be profoundly irresponsible of me, I think, to, or anyone else, to minimize these improvements um, just because they don't fit with some kind of broader vision of what you think the academy might be. That would be saying, you know, you don't care about these employees today. But there's no reason, I don't think, why we can't push for immediate improvements, you know, improvements today, like in the areas I mentioned, uh, and at the same time, devising strategies that challenge the broader, broader casualization process as a whole, and I think we're going to have to devise those strategies because at the end of the day, even things like full-time contracts, rolling contracts, multi-year contracts, this is still contract work, and it's still precarious work, right? And it doesn't address some of the issues that I've already pointed out, job security, uh, academic freedom, right? Um, it doesn't really address them at all. Having to constantly reapply for one's job, no matter where you are, uh, puts you in a very precarious position. So I hope that during the rest of the conference, we might address how to challenge the broader casualization process at its core. Um, 
I don't know, I don't know the answer. You know, a lot of people have suggested a, a teaching intensive tenure stream uh, from down south, some prominent proposals, and, and there's other things, but uh, I think we're going to have to figure this out. Perhaps the only way to do it, and I've always believed this, is to much more robustly uh, engage the public. Public outreach on this issue is absolutely essential. Why? Because the public is firmly on our side on this issue. Just like they are on almost every measure of corporatization that you can think of. Who does the public trust in all these issues, including administrative issues, research issues, student issues? They trust professors and students, not administrators, uh, not the private sector, and not governments. And you can see this overwhelmingly in almost every poll you look at. Um, the last one I saw, just ridiculous numbers. Again, 87% of Ontarians think part-time professors uh, should receive the same pay for teaching the same courses. 87%, right? 84% should say they should have the same benefits as their permanent colleagues. 85% want them to be converted into full-time appointments before more CIs are added. 87%, 84%, 85%. If we're not paying attention to that, um, and it's not just Ontario, right? It's across the country, and it's not just on this issue. Um, then we're doing something wrong. So there's very, very, very high level of public support for policy measures that would address this issue. Um, that's what we have to do. I think, it, I mean, I've increasingly come to believe that, and hopefully this conference will maybe, uh, it might, I don't know how many of the members of the public will be here, but uh, it might help us in that area too. Um, that's what I hope. That's all I got. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it.